Thanks, Liz. So uh, this webinar today, we have an exciting lineup of presenters. Um, we're talking about funding to support OER development with an equity lens. Our agenda today is to, um, I'll give you a quick overview of our CCC OER and OE Global Overview. Um, our presenters are talking about the CC ECHO project, Rotel project, and the Open Oregon Educational Resources Targeted Pathways project. Please stay tuned um, at the end so I can uh, let you know about some upcoming events and how to stay in the loop. Uh, CCC OER, if this is the first time you're joining us or you're ready for an update, we have about 105 members from 37 states, including Canada. Um, and we are a community of practice supporting and encouraging colleges in the collaborative development of open educational programs to ensure equitable access and success. Feel free to join our email, and Liz just put that in the chat. I do want you to know that our Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee is uh, has openings. Um, there's a link to sign up um, and join this committee uh, to advocate for open educational practices to empower contributions from diverse learners and educators who have been underrepresented. Let us know if you're attending OE Global 23 coming up in November. This OE Global will be focused on indigenous worldviews. It's exciting to have a carbon neutral event. And we have diverse keynote speakers, global participants, a variety of social activities. We will have a CCC OER dinner party. And don't forget there are member discounts. Exciting news today, winners of the uh, Open Education Awards for this year were announced today. Um, Washington Community and Technical College System won an award for their Washington OER and low-cost labeling policies. Congratulations to them. And Kingsborough Community Colleges um, won for an Open Reuse Remix Adaptation. It's exciting news. And Liz has put a link to the live stream for that event that just happened an hour ago, I believe. Our speakers today are Amy Huffer with the Statewide Open Education Program Director from Open Ed Oregon Educational Resources. We'll also be hearing from Kelsey Smith, who is a librarian and CCC ECHO Project Director from West Hills College, Lemur, California. Tu Sue Tajan and Millie Gonzalez will be joining us as well. Sue is the Coordinator of Instructional Design from North Essex Community College in Massachusetts, and Millie Gonzalez is the Dean of Library at Framington, Framington State University, also in Massachusetts. Thank you for spending time with us here today. And um, I'm going to quit sharing and Kelsey, take it away. All right, let me get into presenter mode. Is all my slides are showing okay? Yep, yep, okay. they're good. Awesome. Okay, so today I will, I will be talking about um, the Open Textbook Pilot program, one of the grants called California Consortium for Equitable, Equitable Change in Hispanic Serving Institutions with OER. And since that's such a mouthful, we are also known as CC Echo. So I am Kelsey Smith. I am the project director for this grant, but I am also an OER librarian at West Hills College in Lemoore, which is in Central California. So what is CC Echo? Like I said, it was one of the uh, funded projects from the Open Textbook Pilot Program from the US Department of Education. We are a consortium of four different community colleges here in California, 
West Hills is the uh, primary fiscal lead. We're also working with Allen Hancock College, which is on the Central Coast, College of the Canyons, which is down south, and College of Marin, which is in Northern California. Um, the goals of this grant are, one, was to create peer-reviewed OER for 20, at least 20, high-enrolled courses that had little, little or no OER um, when we first started, which was at the very beginning of 2021. So we're in the last year of our grant now. Um, our second goal is to promote textbook affordability, student success, diversity, equity, and inclusion to benefit all students. And we're particularly uh, focusing on HSIs and the underserved students there. Um, but of course, our work can be um, scaled to other uh, underserved student groups as well. Our third goal was to provide professional development for integrating DEI and OER into the curriculum and to create more culturally relevant uh, resources. And then our fourth and final goal is to share out everything we're doing, so our processes, procedures, training materials, and of course, all of the OER that comes out of our grants as well. Uh, we do have a kind of a landing page that Allen Hancock College is hosting for us, and the URL is um, at the bottom here. It's www.hancockcollege.edu slash ccecho. And we will be posting all of our um, deliverables or OER projects to the site once they finish. Um, so like I mentioned, we were one of the fiscal year 2020 grantees. So we got our funding at the beginning of 2021. Um, this is a three-year grant. And so it's been a bit since we uh, did our application for OTP, but I did want to touch on a few things that I thought were important to um, think about if you are thinking of applying for an open textbook pilot grant. Um, the first thing would be to establish the need. The Department of Ed really wants to know what, what makes your project special, uh, what are your goals, um, and how are you going to fill those gaps in OER that exist. Um, so our goals were to, you know, fill in the OER gaps particularly at high enrolled courses at Hispanic serving institutions. Um, all of the OER we are going to create is based on a diversity, equity, and inclusion framework. And then we also wanted to make sure we shared out all of our resources so people could take what we did and then scale it and implement it at their own institutions. Um, we also did an OER gap analysis back when we were applying for the grant to make sure we identified where those gaps were. Um, and we wanted to make sure that when we were we were applying for the grant, we, we knew where those gaps were and we were um, emphasizing that we weren't duplicating what was already out there, that we were going to add to what was out there and fill in some gaps. Um, it's important also to include on the application for in, any funding, um, how you're going to be measuring impact. What data are you going to be looking at? Um, so will you be uh, collecting qualitative data from interviews and student surveys, or will you be focusing more on quantitative data like student success measures, uh, cost savings, things like that? Um, and it's always great to include, if you can calculate it, an estimate uh, return on investment. So take the amount that you are requesting for your project and then turn around and give usually a cost savings amount if you're able to, uh, cost savings for students, that is. Um, and CC Echo, we are uh, contracted with the RP group, which is the research and planning group for the California Community Colleges. And they're taking care of all of our, most of our data collection um, and measuring student success for us. Another important thing for any funding application is to include information on who's on your team. If you have a multi-member team uh, that will be taking on the project, who's involved, what departments do they work in, what are their credentials, their experience, um, any OER experience that they already have, um, and then who's responsible for what on your project. Uh, for CC Echo, we're working with four different colleges, so it was important to really distinguish between the colleges, 
who's doing what and the roles and responsibilities of each college. Um, and then most importantly, anytime you ask for money, you need to create a budget um, as detailed as you're able to at the time. And it really should be just enough money to achieve the goals that you've outlined um, for whatever stakeholder you are working with. Um, and then this is something we learned after the fact, but I, so I wanted to emphasize it. If you are working with multiple institutions, just keep in mind that all institutions pay faculty differently. Um, some like to do stipends or can only do stipends for faculties, extra load. Some colleges can only do release time and they don't do stipends at all. Um, how will you pay faculty if you wanna bring them in from outside the state or outside your college um, to help you work on something? And even hourly rates between all of our colleges differ. Um, it's, of course, varies widely in California. We have the very high cost of living areas that have a very high hourly weight rate for their faculty. And we have some other areas that have lower hourly rates. So that's something just to keep in mind as you're working on your budget. So the project processes and procedures for CC ECHO uh, specifically, are the yearly gap analysis that I mentioned. Um, we actually ended up doing this quite a few times. We did one while we were writing the narrative for the Department of Ed. And then again, once we got our funding and we're about to start funding projects, and then again for our next round of projects. As you all know, the OER community moves quickly. There's always new OER coming out and a gap that used to be there may not be there the next year. So if you really don't wanna duplicate what's out there, just look for gaps uh, before you start funding something. Uh, we use the diversity, equity, and inclusion framework from the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges called the IDEA framework. Um, it's linked on my last slide. So if you get the slides later, you can check it out. Uh, we also use the peer review rubric with some edits from the Academic Senate as well. Um, the RP group is doing our data collection and evaluation. We have OER specialists that are lovely from the College of the Canyon. So we took infrastructure, infrastructure that was already at our colleges and tapped into them when we could. So the OER specialists at College of the Canyons are current and former students. Um, they help our faculty find OER and format for accessibility and get their textbooks looking all, all nice. Um, and then we really wanted to emphasize that our OER that we share, we're trying to get it in as many file formats as possible and disseminate it on as many platforms as possible. Um, we know certain file formats work better for others. And when it comes to uh, reusing and adapting the OER in the future, PDFs aren't always the best or there's certain websites that are hard to edit. So um, that was something we really wanted to make sure we did. So I'm just going to highlight quickly three of our projects that really, um, I guess it would be highlighting the DEI in CC Echo. So one of the projects that um, I'm going to touch on is the American Government Audiobook. So we had Brian Barrick, um, who is a political science instructor at LA Harbor College, and his a former student, Sarah Aria. They narrated the OpenStax American Government Third Edition book. Oh, I am at my 10 minutes. Sorry, let me, real quick, um, there is a link I wanted to mention. Let me go through my slides here. There's a, a QR code for everyone up here. Um, and if you get the slides later, you can click on it and it'll take you directly to the book. Um, so, you know, audiobooks are great for English language learners, people with disabilities, et cetera. We have an ethics studies book, which is very important in California. Now that we have a new GE uh, specific to ethics studies. And we also included uh, people of color and adjuncts in this, the creation of this textbook. And we are working on a Spanish translation. Uh, we have a new microbiology lab manual that does scientist spotlights on people that were often excluded from other science materials. And some lessons learned. Uh, one thing I wanted to touch on, there's several on the slide, but just to be quick, 
faculty, um, they're going to be at all different levels of OER expertise. And um, some of them, many of them haven't created OER before. And so we learned after the fact that we probably should have put more support in the way of accessibility and formatting, licensing, and dissemination of their projects. And so we are working with them on that now. Here's some resources um, for you to check out. Um, our peer review rubric and our DEI framework are listed on the slide. So uh, someone's putting links in for me. Thank you. All right. Sorry. I'm done. No, you're good. Exactly right. Thanks, Kelsey. Um, that was amazing. Let me stop sharing. There we go. All right. And I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. Thank you, Sue and Millie. Take it away. Hello, everyone. My name is Millie Gonzalez from Birmingham State University. And Sue and I are going to be talking about Rotel, remixing open textbooks through an equity lens. Next slide, please. A little bit about the grant. Um, so it is from the, uh, we were funded by the open textbook pilot, $1.3 million. It didn't come at, you know, one full, you know, one chunk. So, you know, so it was interesting the way that it came. That's another story for another time. What's what really special about the grant is it, it's a collaboration of, of three universities, state universities and three community colleges. This is something that personally, I haven't seen this type of collaboration and it's only enriched the, pro the project. Uh, the grant pays stipends to faculty. We provide institutional support at each institution. We provide extensive training, and then we also have an industry um, advisory board. So um, if you can just uh, go back for a sec. So, you know, the goal really is to remix and develop accessible, intentionally inclusive OER. So from its inception, we are centering accessibility and um, inclusive equity. So um, and it's important to reflect the students' local and lived experiences, um, particularly from underserved communities. Um, information about the stipends for faculty, um, a little bit about the support. We provide support and training, and we, you know, we actually had to develop this. Um, we created our own entity, and then we enlisted the OER heavy hitters, right? We partnered with Rebus Foundation. Um, we actually developed um, a uh, publishing success team. We have training webinars. We reached out to um, consultants who are experts in DEI and accessibility. And then our goal at the very end is really to ensure scalability and longevity and really promote um, the textbooks, not only within Massachusetts, but statewide and nationwide. So as I mentioned before, um, really, you know, in its inception, we are focused on making the textbooks inclusive and equity focused. So as I mentioned before, we partnered with, with leading um, experts in OER and accessibility Without their expertise, we we you know the project would not be as successful as it is. Um, you know, faculty are exposed to training through mentoring and consultations and things like that. So it's personal, it's group training, things like that. Um, as I mentioned before, we actually realized, oh my gosh, we need we're actually publishing these textbooks. So we ended up creating a publishing support team. And what was important is we brought in our, um, our vendors, our experts, and, and the publishing support team members were thoroughly trained in inclusiveness and accessibility. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do is we wanted to encourage diverse faculty to remix textbooks. Um, and you know, and I, it was quite surprising how difficult that was to enlist um, faculty of color. Um, to be interested in this project. So, you know, so we have some lessons learned how to do more outreach. Um, you know, from the outset, we when we talked to faculty, we wanted to make sure that the textbooks that they produce, they were intentional about representation, pronouns, accessibility, and context. And most importantly, 
we anticipate st uh, student learning outcomes that will be improved, again, particularly from underserved communities because of exposure to an inclusive, accessible textbook. And how will we know? We're gonna track it through assessment. Next slide, please. I'll turn it over to Sue. All right, so Millie talked a little bit already about our partners, but um, our goal in partnering with the professional organizations is really to offer the ability to offer a high quality output of the OER creation and ensure that it is shared widely. So um, Rebus community, all of our faculty um, went through the textbook success program. And we felt that the faculty that did go through that program were much better prepared when it came to writing their textbooks. Um, you know, we partner with Hypothesis. Um, so faculty um, to encourage, you know, open pedagogy practices by really allowing students to interact with the textbooks. Um, you know, Pressbooks, is the publishing platform that we chose. Um, so we wanted, like I said, the high quality output. Um, and lastly, we, um, well, Millie already mentioned ISME and the professional development training that they offered around accessibility and um, DEI. And then the, lastly, the, um, we are working with Dr. Michelle Cromwell as our diversity, equity, inclusion consultant to work individually with our faculty to ensure that their textbooks are centered in equity. And she has been reading through all of the textbooks and meeting and consulting with faculty through the process. Next slide, please. And the publishing support team, as Millie said, we quickly realized that faculty needed more support to get their textbooks to the finish line. Um, so, and of course my phone is ringing, sorry. <laughs> if you can hear it in the background and it won't stop. Um, based on um, this need, Rotel um, has established a grant-wide faculty publishing support team led by Marilyn Billings, who is, I believe, on this um, call today. And this team works in conjunction with each of the local institutions. Um, so the purpose is to provide a consistent level of support and look and feel to faculty projects that are funded by Rotel. Um, it consists of Marilyn, who is at the faculty advisor and the point of contact for the faculty. We have two content editors, um, a media specialist who works with faculty on interaction, H5P activities, images, things like that. And then we have a technical editor who has developed a style guide who um, is, you know, ensuring that our, the faculty, the books are getting into press books. And if you are at OE Global, Maryland will be presenting <laughs> a couple of times, I believe. So you can learn more about this team, but I truly, believe that the PST, the publishing support team, is a model worth considering and duplicating for these types of OER publishing projects. Um, and it's really made a huge difference for us. All right, next slide, please. So the assessment, so what does success look like? How are we gonna measure it? Um, outside of the data that we need to report to the grant, we're using the um, COOP framework that allows, you know, for more advanced, um, you know, assessment outside of just the cost savings. And then the perceptions area is really where we wanted to focus. So we have a student perception survey that we created um, that will tell us are these textbooks making a difference? Are they, um, are students feeling more included? Are faculty feeling more engaged and included? And we kind of based our um, survey off of a survey that Amy had created and shared with us. So thank you for that, Amy. <laughs> All right, and the next slide, please. So the most exciting part now are our books. Next slide. All of our, um, textbooks, as we, as you know, are equity centered, thereby enabling um, minoritized and marginalized students to have their needs, experiences, 
and stories centered in the content and the pedagogy. So the first book that I'd like to um, just talk about quickly is, and these books have not been published yet, but they are coming soon, um, Social Work Practice and Disability Communities by Elspeth Slater and Lisa Johnson. Um, so the main goal of this textbook is to introduce an intersectionality informed and critically culturally competent approach to anti-oppressive social work practice with dis disabled people in the United States. So the themes um, woven throughout the book are the intersectionality theory and critical competence framework. Um, the secondary objective is to present the experiences of a range of disabled people um, with different social identities and various service areas as a way to inform better social work practice. So we're very excited about this book. Um, next slide. The next book is The Whole Child from um, two faculty at Northern Essex Community College, Professor Budziner and Buckley. They collaborated on this project with a strong commitment to creating a culturally relevant content that's relative to all of their students a majority of whom are Hispanic. The course is required by all Massachusetts early childhood educators to receive their teacher licensure. So it's widely used across the community colleges. Um, and they have spent the past few semesters using the book and really getting a lot of student input from it and having the students help create the content of the book with them. All right, next slide. And the next book I would say is very exciting, um, Statistics Through an Equity Lens by Professor Yvonne Anthony at Framingham State University. Um, Dr. Anthony has observed over the many years of teaching statistics that the statistics education community has not yet emphasized how to improve achievement of traditionally underserved and marginalized students. So um, her project is an opportunity to help fill this void. Um, each chapter, there is an intentional focus on promoting equity in society um, and using data that is not generally used in statistics textbooks to improve social is issues in society. So another book that we're excited about. <laughs> All of them we are. So next slide. And what are the results? So in five years, this is what we hope this will look like. We have 43 projects that will be published, 58 authors um, in total, 1,290 students reached, um, a projected savings for one year of $149,000, which we know will be a lot higher because there are more than one section of each, um, you know, of each course taught. Um, six institutions, and you can see at the bottom the cost savings. Um, so those are the results. And hopefully lots of improvement in student learning outcomes through the focus of equity centered in each of these textbooks. And next slide. The last um, slide, I'm gonna just hand it back to Millie quickly um, is to, talk about the challenges um, because of course, not to end on a negative note, but we do, there were a lot of challenges. So what we discovered is that we were quite naive in the very beginning of the grant and we didn't realize and understand how complex the grant is, which is okay. But you know, when you're, when you're thinking about writing your grant, you also have to take into consideration that it's gonna end up to be a lot harder, <laughs> right? You know, we were initially um, ambitious. We projected 70 textbooks. What on earth were we thinking of? So, but we landed in, you know, like around 40. So heavy workload, you know, that's what it is. You know, it's really hard when you have six institutions in terms of the uh, communication. So we're always trying to improve that. Um, you know, we are not publishers, right? We learned quickly that we needed to create a publishing team. So that was just really interesting. You know, the perception that faculty had, I mean, what we've provided faculty is pretty damn good, right? And they're like, is that all? So, you know, so 
it is really setting the expectations and reminding them that this is something that is unique and that our individual institutions just couldn't provide. Um, and, you know, and it is a lot of work. And so, you know, that's one thing to, to remember, but, you know, it, when it boils down to, when we think about the, what we are trying to achieve, we will do it, you know, no matter what, any time again. So it is challenging, you know, there is a lot of work. It's on top of our regular work, but we would do it in a second and I would do anything to work with Sue again. Thank you. So this is the information resources. If you want some more information about Rotel, the list of projects, um, we're very excited to share our results and thank you so much. Sorry, Millie. Thank you both, Millie and Sue. If you're watching the chat, there's quite a bit of, uh, quite a few responses here. Thanks, Amy. Okay, can you see my screen okay? Alrighty. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Targeted Pathways Project in Oregon, and um, as one of the other groups mentioned, we didn't initially receive the funding um, when we first proposed this grant. Um, and I just want to um, emphasize that um, having a grant proposal not funded means that you have pretty well thought through models in your back pocket that's kind of shovel ready. So um, when we, when Oregon was thinking about how to allocate the GEAR funding, Governor's Emergency Education Relief Funding, you know, COVID pandemic relief funding, um, and we had just spent, um, you know, a lot of effort to create this um, federal OER grant proposal, um, I was like, hey, here's a project that is pretty much ready to go. So. Um, that was um, a really persuasive um, thing to be able to say to our higher education coordinating commission. Um, and then um, later, as as Millie mentioned, it's like a bit of a um, story, <laughs> but um, we received partial funding and then there was another allocation and we received full funding. So the projects that I'm gonna tell you about were funded by the Open Textbook Pilot um, Program, um, the federal OER grant program and also gear funding. The pandemic funding ended right um, in June, so now it is fully under the umbrella of the federal OER grant funding. Um, so anyway, just to kind of normalize that it was like a bit of a twisty road to get where we are. Um, so our project goal is to develop high quality, accessible, open educational resources, including textbooks and course materials with an equity, diversity and inclusion lens. And this is a graphic that our previous um, grant project manager, Phoebe Dario created to really show that the student's experience with the OER is at the forefront of what we're doing. Our goal is to keep that in mind at every step. And the way that we've defined quality um, is in the circles that are around um, the student's experience. So um, we consider a high quality text to be relevant, meaning that our students show up in our texts through representation and Oregon specific contexts and inclusive assignments. High quality also means accessible. So it's usable by people with disabilities to the greatest extent possible, aligned with state course outcomes and workforce standards and designed with an equity lens, meaning it's transparent, there's aligned mm -hmm. learning pathways, clear expectations, clear connections between the course content and the student experience and engagement. So having a really strong definition of quality has guided us. Um, and I think um, in this group, it's really clear what an openly licensed textbook is, right? The book has the open license where the creator retains their copyright, but is giving future users permissions to do what we call the five R's. Um, and alongside that, we're also sharing openly licensed course packs. So those are learning pathways that are complete with module structures and um, you know aligned outcomes and objectives, learning management system shells and other ancillaries like assessments and activity outlines. So we're removing barriers for students by providing low cost and no cost materials that have this equity lens in their design. But we also really wanna remove barriers for future instructors to make it as simple as possible to adopt 
or if it's not exactly what you need to adapt. So that's our project goal. And um, these are the courses that we are um, developing OER for. We've got three disciplines, criminal justice, human development, family studies, and sociology. Um, and we're doing lower division courses. Um, lower division courses are relevant at our community colleges and our universities and our dual credit programs in the high schools where students earn college credit while they're before they graduate from high school. So lower division courses are really where we can um, reach the most possible students. Um, and um, at the end of my slides, I have some links to um, other resources and Phoebe and I shared a blog post on OER and beyond about how we um, use different data sources to arrive at the conclusion that these were the courses that we should develop open curriculum for. Um, so um, we had a data-driven approach to identifying high enrollment degree pathways that lead to in-demand occupations with minimal OER currently available. And if you've been reading that um, federal um, request for grant proposals, you will see those keywords show up in the grant requirements. So we really used the data to try to narrow in on what the grant was looking for. Um, we were lucky in that we were able to reuse an existing analysis of statewide data that correlates high enrollment majors with high workforce demand, but um, it would be possible to recreate that um, from data sources in your state if you don't already have that. Um, and I also um, should point out that both criminal justice and HDFS offer career opportunities at every level of credential, right? So there's a workforce element um, at a, with a certificate, an associate, a bachelor's, or even a graduate degree, making the OER that we're creating relevant to um, anyone in a community college or university pursuing those pathways. And then sociology, Lower division sociology in Oregon tends to be more of a transfer course rather than like a workforce development oriented course. Um, but that discipline is often a prerequisite or even um, a pathway requirement in CJ and HDFS. So um, this is how they, all the courses hang together that we were developing. Um, and then the other um, blog posts that we shared on OER and beyond, and again, the link is at the end of my slides, um, is about how we um, talked about um, what we expected the impact of our work to be um, from an equity perspective. So in our grant proposal, we were very open about the fact that, you know, the research in the open ed field shows that the open sense itself is, it's not expected to have an effect on student outcomes. And to me, that makes perfect sense because the open license doesn't tell you about quality in any of the dimensions that I was just mentioning, right? Like the open license tells you about its copyright status and what permissions you have um, to you know, make use of the work. It doesn't tell you about whether it's aligned, relevant, designed with an equity lens or accessible, right? Um, so um, instead our proposal said, okay, that's not where we're gonna be looking for impact. Instead, we expect um, student outcomes to improve because we're going to provide access to higher quality learning materials than those available commercially, right? So we really brought it back, centering it on our definition of quality. And we're expecting to see a positive effect on students' affective experience of the curriculum. And we're also expecting to see improved academic achievement. And as I mentioned in the chat a minute ago, we are working with a professional research firm, RMC Research, to help us do this assessment. Um, and I, I really have um, loved working with them. And it's just great to have a professional because it is, um, you know, sort of beyond my skill set to be able to um, do this research in a way that we can feel really confident in. So having a professional really helps. Um, so I want to also just talk about our project team. Um, I know that all of us have mentioned the importance of support. Um, and I think a common theme is that we needed more support than we initially expected. Um, so we needed more support for our authors and instructors. We found ourselves adding like development consultants for the author teams and adding an instructional technologist and a book designer. Um, you know, all, all kinds of roles to support the folks that were um, creating the OER. But then we also even needed more support for our support. So we had an open education instructional designer on our team and she raised the flag and said, this is more pilots than I can support development for. We need some contractors. So we've been adding 
even more support um, for the supporters that we already thought that we needed. So um, just to um, underline that, um, which I know other folks have also mentioned today. And there's one role that I wanted to particularly pull forward because of the um, topic of this webinar. We um, have two equity consultants on this project and um, Heather Blicker is here and she's one of them. Um, so I just wanted to recognize her um, efforts on this um, project. So, um, oh no, there we go. Um, so these are a few bullets from the request for proposals that we shared when we were looking for equity consultants and that full RFP is also linked at the end of my slides. So don't feel too worried about reading all of this dense text. But um, in summary, we want the equity consultants to help us ensure that considerations of equity, diversity, and inclusion are built into the development process from the very beginning of the project and remain a priority at every step. So this happens on multiple levels. We work with the um, development consultants um, when we need um, you know, another pair of eyes on something that the authors or the pilot instructors have created, um, or if we need um, another pair of eyes looking at peer review feedback that we might or might not share with authors and how do we make that actionable for the authors to take that feedback. Um, but we also really value the equity consultant input on um, the process itself and informing how the leadership team works. So one example of this is creating an equity statement specifically for the Targeted Pathways Project, um, which one of our equity consultants um, led that process. So I just wanted to um, pull this forward and say this is a role that you can build into your grant budget at the proposal stage. Um, and I have um, a few quotes from participants talking about the impact of working with the equity consultants and the um, instructional designers and using open pedagogy I think I won't um, read these out. I know that you have the link to the slides, but I want to leave enough time for questions. But um, to me, the takeaway from these statements, um, you know, just with my coordinator hat on is just how incredible the people on this project are and how wonderful it's been to work with them. And um, we're very excited that we get to share their work hopefully soon. Um, so these are the questions that I imagine people might have. <laughs> so um, maybe I'm heading off a few chats um, at the past. So can you pilot the OER course materials? If you looked at that list of courses and um, they're relevant to you, please reach out to me. My email address is on this slide and I'll also put it in the chat. We're prioritizing Oregon pilots, but there is room for us to look beyond Oregon um, so yes, um, you can pilot and um, it's not the final launch version yet. It's a new script that has been through one pilot and is now under revision. So that's that's what you would be piloting now. Um, and when will the OER textbooks be out of pilot mode? We're looking forward to a launch next spring, 2024. Um, part of our grant is to disseminate the open curriculum development model that we have created to guide these 12 projects um, from start to finish. And we're gonna share that at the end of our grant period, which is going to be August, 2024. Um, that's gonna be like the big book of everything. <laughs> it's getting very big. Um, and all of this will be shared on openoregon.org. And um, reach out to me if you um, wanna talk about any of this or you know find out how to be notified. So um, this is the slide with links to more information. The first two links here are the blog posts um, that I mentioned from Phoebe and me on OER and beyond that are relevant to anyone who's writing a federal OER grant right now. Um, and then we've got a couple of posts on the openoregon.org blog about um, a couple of the different roles that I didn't talk about so much today, our research consultant and her workforce advisory board roles. Um, and then last is the request for proposals that I mentioned when we were um, hiring equity consultants. And um, one last thing here, lessons learned. Um, I've got an image of a very tall pile of papers. And what I mean to say by that is that it's a very tall pile of lessons learned ongoing, I would say. Um, and just a couple of things to share um, that very much echo the wisdom of the other presenters as well. Um, you know, thinking about um, timing and trying to avoid 
eating up your grant funded time on recruitment and decision making, if at all possible. So in the proposal stage, if you can think ahead about your structure and your partners and get those in place so that when the funding comes, you're ready to go as much as possible. Um, that's the more efficient use of the time once the clock starts ticking on the grant. Um, in terms of capacity, something that I've been thinking about is um, sort of a compare and contrast. Like, are you looking for funding that is going to build your core capacity, um, right? Like that would be one kind of grant writing process. Or are you going to leave your core operations exactly as they are and look for grant funding that'll let you do stretch activities that are outside of your normal operations? And then at the end of the grant period, maybe it becomes sustainable to roll that into your core operations, but it's something that's sort of a satellite of what you are currently doing. So just two ways to think about capacity that might help clarify um, if you're writing a proposal. And then, um, the third piece of advice is that you'll very likely need a project manager. I really recommend writing that in as a line item. Um, I think if you want someone at about one, one day a week, like 50 bucks an hour, you would put in about $15,000 a year. And then, you know, maybe you'd be able to hire someone full time if there's more room in your grant budget. Um, but it is a really important role. Um, and if it's someone who um, only has time to like, help you make sure that your deliverables are on track and like file those federal reports that need to be filed quarterly, like um, that alone, having someone to be able to take that assignment um, would be a huge help. So um, with that, I will turn it back to Lori Beth. Thank you. All right, we do have a few minutes for questions. If you have some questions, you can put them in the chat. I think there were some questions. Um, Let's see, Amy, uh, they were wondering how many books were published and how many authors involved? Oh, yeah. Um, so we're developing 12 books and the number of people involved at this point, um, when we last counted, I think it was like over 70, <laughs> including all of our authors and contributing authors and um pilot instructors and people on the team in general, it, it has become bigger than I ever expected. And I think that's a common theme among everyone who presented today. That's just huge. Um, let's see, Millie, there's a question for you here. Um, what are the lessons learned on recruiting faculty, authors who are people of color, what are effective strategies? So I think that, it, you know, I was kind of surprised um, initially when we started to do the outreach because we, you know, the, the proposals were really excited, the funding was really there just in the support. So when, when the first round we received crickets, we're like, what, you know, what do we have to do, right? Especially because, you know, in our proposal, in our outreach, we are saying um, this is something that is extremely important to, uh, to the, you know, to our grant. So the second round, the second, you know, we had three rounds. So the second round really is, again, you know, within our institutional support teams at our six institutions, it really is, you know, just doing one-on-one -on -one outreach to specific faculty, um, you know, talking to the deans, things like that. Um, you know, and one of the things that we, we, we would like to do, you know, if we do something like this going forward is also, you know, tap into the affinity groups, the existing affinity groups on campus. Like for example, at Framingham State, there's a faculty of color um, you know, uh, affinity group. There's also a faculty of color mentoring thing. So there are opportunities to, you know, to reach out. But uh, but initially I was quite surprised. Um, but that one on one on one outreach is extremely important. Um, but I think we can always do better. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Thank you all so much. 
I'm going to have to go back over and take a look at some of the links and the slides. It's great stuff. Our future fall webinar series are going to, on October 11th, um, Kimberly Carter will host a panel um, uh, talking about uh, faculty buy-in for OER adoption and development. On uh, November 15th, we're going to um, have a presentation on designing inclusive and accessible OER courses. Um, with EDI and UDL. And then on December 13th, we're measuring impact with open ed course markings. I did want to mention that we use the um, feedback um, for uh, planning future webinars. If you take time to fill out the survey at the end, that'd be great. Please stay in the loop. Um, join our community email, or you're welcome to read the EDI blog posts and the student OER impact stories. This is the feedback. If you wouldn't mind filling out a short survey so that we can um, plan future, Liz has put that in the chat. Thank you again to all of our presenters. And uh, feel free to email us with any questions or comments. I had another question, Lori yeah, Beth. Please. Um, so um, uh, Kelsey Smith from CC Echo mentioned some of the professional development courses that were developed um, that they want to share widely. Um, and I wondered if she wanted to mention some of those. Um, well, we still have everyone here. Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. So we have um, two, sorry, my memory is a little bad today. Um, one of which had just, we piloted this summer. Um, it's all about using um, OER and open pedagogy for, um, I think the focus of the course was for HSIs, but all underserved students in general. Um, they that one is available on Canvas Commons. I'm sorry, I don't have the exact title of it right now, but if you, um, Liz or Una, could you put in the CC Echo homepage? Or I can when I'm done. And then sure. the other course, the other course was done a couple of years ago now. Um, it's a fantastic course if you have support staff on your campus for OER. It's all about hiring and training OER support staff, whether that's students or classified, to get them ready and prepared to help your faculty with OER adapt adaptation or creation. And that one, I believe, is called the OER Specialist. Specialist course. Yes. Yeah. And the, I put the case study link in earlier. Oh, We've done case studies on all of those where you can find out a little more about them. Uh, <laughs> I just have to go back and look that up again. Um, and the um, first course I mentioned is available in both a self-paced, as a self-paced course, um, and a facilitated version. So if you have someone on your campus that can facilitate the course for a group of faculty, or you just want them to work through it on their own. Yeah, so they're all, if you just go through this link I put there, um, you can see those courses. And um, they're available for, you know, uh, colleges that may not have that support directly and might want to adopt them because they're all openly licensed. Thanks, Kelsey. Thank you. There was a question here if the slides will be available. And yes, this does make the slides available on our website, cccoer.org. Thank, Thank Amy. You put them in. <laughs> Thanks, oh, Amy. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. We have a few more minutes if anyone has any other questions. Oh, here's, here's a wild question. Would you do it all over again? <laughs> I know it's a lot of work and it's a little bit of a joke, but I, I think you go into these grants and of course we're so excited, right? You know, and then, wow. I think that's a really good question. And to be honest, um, when the 
um, federal OER grant folks got back to me and said, um, how about um, accepting your proposal at one third of the proposed budget? Um, mm -hmm. And please rewrite the budget narrative to fit this. Um, I really did think about saying no, um, because it is so much work to do it. And I sat down with a spreadsheet and realized that I would still be able to hire a full-time project manager um, at that lower funding level. And to me, that made it worth it. But like, yeah, I, I think that's not a silly question at all. I think it's a really serious question. <laughs> I wonder what the other folks would say. I was going to say absolutely, but I would do it differently. Um, and I would take a lot of Amy's advice about hiring support for your support. And um, we need a lot more support. And uh, we had a lot of turnover during it. And suddenly I became PI and project director. And I didn't have a project manager like Amy was saying. It would have been great. Um, and Elle is here. Elle is our, our lead at Marin. And we... The leads at each college ended up having to do a lot more support than we knew we needed to do. Um, so I think we would have structured things a little bit differently and used our funding for more support to um, help us with less stress next time. But I've it's been a great experience and I've learned so much through this experience as well. And I agree with that. And I think now that we have had all of this experience, we would do things a lot differently, but I would definitely do it again, especially since now we have this, um, you know, whole process in place. And in Massachusetts, we don't have any funding for OER. So it, these grants are really the only way that we can like keep this going for now. So we're hoping that, who knows, maybe, there might be another grant coming. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Don't forget to fill out that survey.